Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. I don't think, I don't think that I see guests with little ones. We do have a nursing mother's room and you can always take uh, one of your little ones that needs to be quieted right back through that door. We have a large screen where you can follow the message. <clears throat> this morning we're going to take up once again verses 32 through 38 of Matthew chapter 27. Thank you. <clears throat> I need an assistant to turn my microphone on. Uh, Matthew chapter 27, we're going to read verses 32 through 38. Brethren, Matthew's gospel has been building up to chapters 26 through 28. I hope you've been reading them regularly. Uh, this is the heart and soul of the book. This is what it's about. Uh, so I do pray that as we read together, we'll try to clear away the cobwebs, that we'll try to clear away the distractions. I don't know, but my mind wants to be Grand Central Station very often whenever I want to get central thoughts about the Lord Jesus. All of a sudden, everything in the week wants to pile in, and it's time to push those things out and hear God. Let's hear God. It's right here in his word. Well, let's stand together. We want to give our attention. May this precious word be blessed to your soul. Verse 32, and as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them. And upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And set up over his head his accusation written. This is Jesus the king of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him. One on the right hand and another on the left. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his spirit breathed infallible word. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Father, we want to focus our hearts and minds upon Thee. We want to hear Thy Spirit in Thy Word. We want Thy truth ringing in our soul. We want the Spirit filling our heart. We want Christ the Lord reigning in our heart. We want our hearts to be the holy chamber where the King of Kings rules in majesty and holiness. We have many desires this morning. Lord, I pray that we have come to worship. That we have come 
with our hearts set on where our treasure is. And I pray that that treasure is now and always will be Christ Jesus. Oh, precious Jesus, we have just sung a hymn that so beautifully captures all that's in this chapter. Now help as I speak. This, this is a weak vessel, Lord, thou knowest. But I believe in thy Holy Spirit. I believe that I cannot save a soul. I believe that I cannot stir a soul to love thee. I believe that I can do positive damage without thy Spirit. But I do believe in thy Holy Spirit and I believe that thy glorious, inspired and infallible word comes into the souls of the lost and saves them. And I believe that it comes into the hearts of those that are born again and sanctifies them. Lord God, we're not here for entertainment. We are here in the presence of the Almighty to lift up our voices in praise, adoration, thanksgiving. Lord, thy spirit is real. Be generous. Be generous today. Shed abroad thy love through the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. Lord Jesus, come into thy garden and delight in thy bride. Wash us with the water of the word. Make us a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Give us a holy love for thee and for one another. Father, are there problems here? Lord Jesus, if you added an eighth church to Revelation and it was Mount Zion, what would you say? Would you say, I have somewhat against thee? Father, are there hard feelings here? Are there complaining spirits, murmuring spirits? Are there fearful, troubled spirits? Are there angry, grudge-bearing spirits? Are there hearts and minds filled with unbelief rather than trusting in thee? Wouldst thou help us if it's yes to any of them? Father, no doubt each of us is weak and feeble and needs thy great strength today. Wilt thou please come? Meet with us. Lord, lift up the hands that hang down. Strengthen the feeble knees. I believe, O oh Lord, that thy spirit really does fill thy people. Thy book shows us and so does history. We're hungry. If we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children. Lord Jesus, thou didst say that thy Father will give this spirit to them that ask. We're asking for a generous moving of thy spirit. We know that all of thy dear born again people have thy spirit. But move in our midst, Lord. Stir us to love for thee and for one another. Lord, if our hearts are truly right with thee, we will do right by one another. Father, I pray for those that are sick or that have lingering conditions. I pray for uh, Ken Janney. Lord, we certainly pray that in his weakened condition you would preserve him from COVID <clears throat> or anything else, oh Lord. His body is in a weakened state. But oh God, how we pray that the glorious light of Christ who shines 
into the hearts of God's people would shine in his and help him to see his days are numbered as all of ours are. And we will soon be in eternity. Have mercy. Strengthen Donna. Build her up in the faith. Give her strength. Father, we pray for our brother Don Palmer. Lord, he's been exposed to this pandemic. And we pray that the, the testing that he has now done will come back negative. Lord, preserve him. Preserve Laura. Preserve grace and faith. Keep thy handy, hand of mercy upon them. And Father, I pray thou wouldst have mercy upon thy people here. Father, thou knowest that part of our state is being ravaged with exploding numbers. We thank thee for the kindness thou hast shown here, but Lord, we keep watching. We're asking for great wisdom as these days advance. Give us great wisdom in our uh, assessment of things, in our meeting, in what steps we need to take. We want to honor thee in everything. Father, I pray for the lost in our midst this morning. I pray that thou would show them the awfulness of their sins and the utter willingness of the Savior to save sinners. O oh Christ, now at the fountain, the deep, sweet well of love, may we drink deeply today. Lord, thou didst promise that rivers of living water flow from them that come to thee. May we know rivers of living water today. Convict us of sin. Grant us repentance. And may we have fellowship, joy unspeakable in our God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. After arriving at Golgotha, the place of a skull, the Roman execution squad gave Jesus sour wine with gall and myrrh. But once he tasted it, our Savior refused to drink it. He would do nothing that would keep him from experiencing to the fullest his Father's wrath for the sins of the world. When we read with solemnity, and they crucified him. When we read that, what goes through our mind? Is it not remarkable when we give it just a little thought? How few details actually exist in the Gospels about crucifixion? Most of what you and I know about crucifixion have, has come from sermons we've read and, and, and book, uh, books we've read and sermons that we've heard. <clears throat> the people of Christ's day knew what this horror was. <clears throat> we don't. So, while people can go overboard in describing it, on one hand, very often we're simply blank on the other. We know it was something bad. We know it was something painful. Uh, it might even be something that stirs us to a tear here or there. Maybe. But those words are vital. Heart and soul of the word of God. The Roman soldiers were probably used to this gruesome execution. But as we saw in our previous message, the soldiers crucified Jesus because the Jews demanded it. The Romans agreed to it. 
Jesus gave himself to it voluntarily and because his father ordained it before the foundation of the world. So that crucial moment in the drama of redemption took place outside the city walls. Jesus was nailed to a cross in the place of a skull. But what do we see in that horrific scene? I urge you to ponder that. Do you ever take the Gospels, the testimony of the crucifixion of Christ, and meditate on them? Or is it the cross simply part of the furniture of Christianity? What do you see in this horrific scene? So many biblical themes connect. So many Old Testament types and prophecies are fulfilled. So many doctrines emerge. And so many attributes of God harmonize in those four words. In those four words, preachers and authors have produced untold numbers of sermons and books from them. But in this message, we're going to focus on one attribute. One attribute of God, and that is His love. So the title of our message is God's Love Displayed in Christ's Cross. The idea of love and violence and gore are yet not usually put together. But in the Word of God, in this extraordinary text, the most foul crime against heaven displays what we would call perhaps the golden attribute of God, His love. And may our Heavenly Father, who is love, shed abroad His love, His love in Christ, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, that blessed Spirit that is given to His children. And may it be to His eternal glory and our eternal good. So consider first the one main thought of the entire message. The horrors of Golgotha reveal the love of God. The horrors of Golgotha reveal the love of God. This is primarily verses 35 through 38. Now how can that which is horrifying, and it is horrifying if you grasp the notion of crucifixion at all. It's horrifying. How can that manifest God's love? How can that which violates our sense of fairness manifest a just God showing us love? Well, our first thought in answering that is this. Jesus was crucified in the place of a skull. This is 35, the A part of the verse. 
The text is brief, shocking, and brutal. And they crucified him. Multitudes had praised Jesus as the Christ when he entered the city. But now a multitude has followed him to the place of a skull as he exited the city. The soldiers in the execution squad compelled Simon of Cyrene to carry Jesus' cross. If Simon carried Jesus' cross beam only, then they crucified him means that the execution squad removed Jesus' clothing, laid him on the cross beam, held him down, and nailed his hands to it. Next, they hoisted him up and attached that cross beam to a vertical beam that was already in place. Then they nailed Jesus' feet to the vertical beam. If, on the other hand, Simon carried a complete cross, then the soldiers stripped Jesus of his clothing, laid him on the cross, held him down, and nailed his hands and his feet to it. Next, they lifted up the cross and dropped the bottom into a hole, securing it upright, or securing it in an upright position. Now, either way, that jarring movement would have been torturous to Christ's bruised, battered, and bleeding body. Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out devils, and taught the word and ways of God with astonishing authority, with mercy, with grace, with love, with compassion. But now, the sinless Son of God in His body and soul became the exclusive object on earth of his father's omnipotent wrath. Now I ask you. As you look upon his cross. What do you see? We might answer. We see the prophetic word of God. Fulfilled in the incarnate word of God on the cross. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. What do you see? Are you bored? What do you see? He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. What do you see? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, we are healed. What do you see? Do you consider it? Do you think about it? Do you focus your mind on that terrible place of the skull? What do you see? The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. All that is true. And he bore it Alone. All alone. His disciples abandoned him. Peter denied him. 
Judas betrayed him. The Sanhedrin condemned him. The people rejected him. The Romans crucified him. And God cursed him. Hanging him on a tree. And when you gaze upon his cross. Do you see that? What do you see? What do you see? An innocent man unjustly condemned. An inhumane, cruel, gruesome execution. A mutilated, broken, bloody body. But whatever else you may see there, and there is much, I will tell you what you should see. The greatest gift of all. The love of God. That's what you are seeing. The love of God. Following that, Jesus was humiliated in the place of the skull. It says, verse 35, the B part, the second part. Now, my brethren, the following thoughts, the following thoughts are delicate. They're troubling. May the Lord himself grant me the grace to speak with caution. I mean, no offense to anyone's sensitivities or conscience. I do not wish to be unnecessarily descriptive. The sacred text says that after crucifying Jesus, the Roman soldiers parted his garments, casting lots. Mark's gospel says they parted his garments casting lots upon them, what every man should take. Matthew and Mark report with little detail that the soldiers crucified Jesus and divided his clothing among themselves, gambling for his garments. Casting lots was like the modern practice of rolling dice. Now we should notice that those texts do not say they divided some of his garments. John's gospel adds greater detail for us. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not rent it, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Apparently it was the common practice for Roman soldiers who were poor themselves to divide the clothes of their victims. What a bloody mess. Christ's clothing must have been. After that they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him. And put his own raiment on him. And led him away to crucify him. That passage makes clear that when the soldiers marched Jesus from the praetorium to the city gates, they observed the Jews' regard for modesty among the Passover pilgrims. They put his clothes back on him. But once they reached the place of the execution outside the city, they removed all the victim's clothing. His clothes 
would have been standard for a common Jew. Sandals, belt, head covering, outer robe, and inner garment. Five pieces. Now, by John's account, the four soldiers each received a garment, then they gambled for the fifth piece. What does it say? Well, it, it talks about his coat. In that culture, the names of garments were not as precise as our day. And same thing uh, even with our blessed translators. This coat was a tunic. The Greek is kiton. It was a tunic. It was an undergarment. And when we think of undergarments, it is not the kind of undergarments they thought about or had. This was a tunic that reached from the neck to below the knee or down to the ankles. That was the standard undergarment. Christ's was seamless. And the soldiers recognized that. And they said, oh, we, wanna, we don't want to tear this up just so that everybody has a part. Let's have a little fun here and let's roll the dice for it. Now, that keton, that tunic, that coat was worn next to the skin. So, at the foot of the cross, in that dreadful place, the soldiers took all of his clothes and gambled for his last earthly possession. Now, why spend any time on what appears to be a minor point? Why? Well, the point is not minor for at least two reasons. To his last breath, Jesus was to be brutalized, crucified, and humiliated. In our day of common nakedness, even by people that profess to be Christians, we rarely get the point of this passage. But taking all his clothes, all his clothes, meant stripping him of his last human dignity. He was hung in a horrifying condition and the last bit of covering as a human being was taken. The shame, the horror of that image points out the depravity of human beings. Of the 29 sources I consulted, 27 agreed that the historical records declare that Roman soldiers always took all their victims' clothing. Some commentators do suggest that Jesus may have been granted a loincloth. That's possible, but the main reason that would ever come to our minds is because of Jesus movies and Roman Catholicism. You can't do this in the movies. There is no textual support for the idea that all of a sudden they had mercy and regarded his modesty. The purpose of that death was not only to hurt but to shame the Holy Son of God 
was shamed before his creatures. He hung on a cross by a major road going in and out of the city. This is not off in a corner where no one could see. In that shameful condition, he hung. Secondly, it is not a minor point because the Holy Spirit says that the removal of Jesus' clothing was the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. That's not a side point. Referring to Psalm 22, Matthew says, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture. Did they cast lots? It's not simply because they're gambling over his clothes. It is because of the shame and the humiliation. And they're gambling at the foot of his cross. To our great surprise... The Holy Spirit who breathed this word gives us more words about Jesus' garments than about his crucifixion. That's amazing. We often focus on certain things and leave other things uh, in a neglected state. It wasn't only that he was hung on the cross, but the condition in which he was hung on the cross. Everything was calculated by heaven for the utter payment of all the sins of all of God's people, which includes the shame of our sins. My precious brothers and sisters, Genesis tells us of the first Adam. They were both naked says the inspired word of God, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And then they sinned against God. For that reason, the last Adam hung upon the cross without his clothing and ashamed. The result of sin. As we think of that terrible reality, what should we see? Well, our natural response is, I don't even think about that. I don't even want an image like that. But what should we see? Do we see simply the blood-stained clothing of our Savior in the hands of the, of the guards? I will tell you what we should see in that tragic humiliation. We should see the love of God. You should be ashamed of your sins. I should be ashamed of my sins. And we stand, as it were, naked before God. He sees us He knows us. You cannot hide your thoughts from Him. You cannot hide your words from Him. You cannot hide your deeds. And I could guarantee you, if I had enough time, I could find something in everybody's life they'd rather die than let anyone else know that they've done or said. Christ bore that on the cross. That is the love of God. When some of us would rather die than to have our history known and published, Christ bore it for us. Jesus' bloody clothing has covered us with the clean. And white and fine linen 
of his righteousness. As it says in Revelation, the marriage supper of the Lamb is coming. And of Christ's church, it is said, to her was granted. She didn't have it by nature. She didn't have it by nature. And you've got no righteousness before which you can stand in God's holy presence of your own. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Sin is dirty. Every sin. It is filthy and foul and worthy of God's most intense hatred. And were our foul deeds published right here so we could all see what's going on in each other's minds right now. That we could all see what goes on in these hearts. Some of us would die. Jesus bore it all on the cross. His humiliation is our confidence before God. Thirdly, Jesus was kept from any help in the place of the skull. <clears throat> Verse 36, the text says, And sitting down, they watched him there. Once again, we have a detail that seems small as we take in the entire horrific picture, that scenario of Golgotha. Yet every word of God is pure. This is not filler. And this detail figures large in the unfolding drama of redemption. The execution squad was, has nailed Jesus to the cross, taking his clothes and hanging him in plain view of those who pass by going to and fro into the city. Now they sat down and looked at their ghastly work. What were they doing? Why did they sit down and watch? They were making sure that family or friends did not show up to take him down from the cross. Or family and friends that would come by and put him out of his misery and kill him. Astonishing as it may seem, history records some examples of crucified people being rescued from their crosses. And occasionally someone killed the suffering victim to ease the, excru the excruciating torment. Especially if they'd been up there for several days. It could take as much as four days for someone to die. And they would plead with passerby to kill them and put them out of their misery. So the soldiers had an ugly job. They had to sit and watch and make sure no one came to rescue him. Rome assigned soldiers not only to crucify, but to secure the site and make sure there was no escape, no deliverance for the victim. They were Rome's insurance that the crucified ones would die. They made sure that he had no help. Could there be a greater picture of helplessness? 
Christ is nailed to the cross. He is writhing in agony. And the soldiers sit and watch to make sure no one helps that figure. Doesn't have to worry about the disciples. They've all run away. What an ugly scene. Why, oh why, this helpless suffering? Isaiah answers, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's why. It wasn't the mean and evil Roman soldiers as such. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was crushing his son for us. He, God the Father, hath put him to grief. If you think I'm exaggerating, there's the text. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. There's the good news in the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, the Father, the offended party is satisfied. He bruised his son. He crushed his son. He did everything necessary to pay for our sins completely. And God is satisfied. Then we look at that ugly and horrible scene. What do we see? Merciless brutality for the one who was merciful, gracious, loving, and healing. That is the price of our redemption. There in the place of the skull, the holy, harmless, undefiled Son of God hangs in indescribable misery, suffering, shame, and with no one to help him in any way. No relief, no comfort, no encouragement. What do you see in that horror? The love of God. Here is what your sin is worth. This is the greatest gift of all. God giving to those who deserve damnation. Now if you don't think you're bad enough to be damned. One, you're not a Christian. Two, you need to be. You're lost. You're without the Savior. How can you look upon the love of God? And not come to him. Look at the price paid. So that you could walk free. But the love of God doesn't stop there. Fourthly Jesus was mocked in the place of a skull. Jesus was mocked. In the place of a skull. Verse 37. The soldiers had set up over his head. The accusation written. This is Jesus the king of the Jews. Now that accusation was written on what we call a placard. It was a sign. And it was nailed to the cross above Jesus' head. Such placards were often hung around the neck of the crucified one. Or they were nailed to the cross. And so it was in our Savior's case. Once again, we may turn to John's Gospel to add a fuller 
picture. John chapter 19 verses 20 through 22 says, The Pilate and Pilate wrote a title. Notice. Who did it come from? Pilate. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now this title then, this is what John says in his gospel. This title, Jesus, the King of the Jews, was then read by many of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh the city. It was near the city. They could see him. They could walk by. And many read it. It was written, says John, in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin languages of the day so that anybody passing by was likely to get the message. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate. The chief priest keeps showing up. They said to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. In other words, <clears throat> I put up with you Jews a great deal. But I'm the one that runs this show. And I've said this and it stays. The written accusations were meant to be a deterrent. In other words, when you saw someone crucified hanging there in unspeakable, Unspeakable anguish and agony, torment of mind and body, and there was hanging on them or on their cross why they were in this condition. It was a deterrent. This will be you if you do what he did. Any de it was a deterrent to any insurrectionist, anyone who posed a threat to the Roman Empire or who caused disruption to the order of the empire. But here again, we see the sovereign hand of God. They're working out God's eternal purpose. Are you the king of the Jews? Was Pilate's first question to Jesus. King of the Jews was the crime for which Jesus was crucified. King of the Jews is the title that the leaders of the Jews utterly rejected. King of the Jews was Pilate's mockery of the Jews. Pilate gets the last laugh. Because he and the Roman Empire rule over the Jews. And their king is hanging on a cross. Here's your king, Jews. And it stayed. Because he was the governor. It was mockery. They had forced his hand with their political pressure. So he got the last word in the accusation above Jesus' head. And once again, we see the sovereignty of God without realizing it. That pagan was preaching the gospel. That pagan was saying to Jews and Gentiles, that's king of the Jews. That's the king of the Jews. He didn't mean it. But God set his testimony before the people of Jerusalem who had rejected him and the Romans who had caved into them. Pilate had the last laugh, but God got the glory as he always will. 
He can raise up the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone will serve God's purpose. Everyone. Your king, O Jews, could not conquer the empire. You would not have your king. So here he hangs for all to see. That is what Pilate is ultimately saying. Now, whether he intended to mock Jesus is unclear. But Pilate certainly argued that Je- because uh, Pilate certainly argued that Jesus was an innocent man. But when we consider the ugly scene before us, surely Jews and Gentile readers would walk out, see that horrifying cross, that mutilated body hanging and bleeding, and seeing King of the Jews? How would that not come across as mockery? There hung the brutalized body of a man with his last measure of human dignity stripped from him. What kind of king is that? He had no army, no weapons, no horses, no chariots, no force, no cavalry coming to Calvary. But though Pilate had the last laugh at the expense of the Jews, God was setting forth his king triumphantly. Jesus was crushing the serpent's head. For those, I mean, what what supreme irony is here set before us, brethren? Look at this irony. Irony, God's son, God's king hangs on the cross in Golgotha in unimaginable anguish and shame. When you gaze upon Christ's cross then, when you look at this horrifying scene, what do you see? For those who have eyes to see and for those who have ears to hear, we see the greatest act of Christ's kingly and earthly majesty. The kings of the earth want you to die for them. The king of heaven died for his citizens. Not one of them worth it. The glory and the beauty of Christ in this broken body, behind this self-sacrifice, we see the love of God. It's the love of God. It is the love of God. It's not a mushy feeling. It's an overwhelming thought bigger than our hearts can take. Finally, Jesus was degraded on the skull. Jesus was degraded on the skull. Verse 38. Let's look at the final mockery mockery and degradation of Christ in the place of a skull. Now children, degradation means going from a higher state to a lower state of respect. In other words, you see someone and you think something of them that might be high. But if they are degraded, they lose that respect. They're they're put down in a lower place. I hope you understand that idea. Because that's what's going on here. It is astonishing. The text says, Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. These two wicked men, crucified and suffering on either side of Jesus, were either thieves insurrectionists or both. Uh, The Greek carries both ideas. Uh, There would be those that would propose that these two men were to die with Barabbas, who was an insurrectionist and a murderer, and that Jesus simply took Barabbas's place. That's possible. The text doesn't say it one way or the other. 
What we know is that the common interpretation of the words is thieves. They were thieves. But Barabbas was a murderer as well as an insurrectionist, so it's certainly possible for someone to be a thief and be an insurrectionist. But Christ's crucifixion was not only painful, merciless, shameful, it was degrading. It was degrading. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. But what did the Sanhedrin say? He is guilty of death. Jesus was degraded. People had kissed his feet, anointed him with precious ointment, expressed their love for and thanks to him. But the Sanhedrin spit in his face and buffeted him and others smote him with the palms of their hands. Jesus was degraded. People had declared that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son of God, the King of Israel. But vast numbers that had followed Jesus throughout his ministry. People that he healed and fed and taught. He was hailed as the son of David at the beginning of Passover week. And then a few days later, he hangs without the city. He was degraded from praise to punishment, from glory to gory, he was degraded. That holy person, there'd never been anyone like him on the planet and there isn't now and there won't be until he returns and makes a new heaven and new earth. And even then his people will not be him, they'll be like him. For they shall see him as he is. Jesus is utterly unique, glorious, pure, holy, harmless, undefiled. Everything he did was godlike. But he was degraded. And he hangs with two thieves. Imagine the person that you hold in the highest esteem. Everybody here surely has at least one person like that. Maybe you've got several. But someone that you hold in the highest esteem. And then imagine seeing that person hung up without clothes, brutalized, and hanging with the lowest, scummiest criminals. What would go on in your mind? Something far greater than that's happening right here. This is the Son of God. This is the Son of God. How did the people view him? Isaiah tells us, we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In other words, when they saw him out there, they said, look, God cursed him. He's hung on the tree outside the city. Oh, and we thought he was something. The chief priest set us straight. We understand him now. His crucifixion outside the city set it all. Cursed of God. Cursed of God. His crucifixion. Oh my. Look at the dreadful place of the skull. Jesus hangs between two thieves. Crucifixion was for the worst of human beings. Murderers, cutthroats, slaves, thieves, and the vilest people. Jesus, the Son of God, was degraded. And his Father purposed it. So that you and I could have everlasting life. It wasn't an accident. It was not a mistake. The Lord wasn't looking at something else going on in the world and missed what was going on with his son. Oh no, what did they do? Mm -mm. 
God the Father in his love for us turned his son over to these things that we might be cleansed and have everlasting life. Jews and Romans should have fallen at his feet and kissed them, worshipped and adored him, declared his goodness, holiness, sinliness, sinlessness, and loved, loved him with all their hearts and souls and mind for his person and for his work. But what did they do? They spit on him, beat him, scourged him, stripped him, crucified him between two criminals. Jesus was degraded. When it's you and I that need to be degraded. It's you and I. We have such exalted views of ourselves. And we sin. And we think it's so terrible when somebody else sins. But it's not so bad when we do. Especially because we might have this list of five things that we do or don't do. And somebody else does them or don't, doesn't do them. Right? It's called self-righteousness. But it shields you from how God sees you. Do we get this? That should be us on the place of the skull. But Jesus took it all for us. Why? Why? Because God loves us. God loves us. If you cannot see it here, I don't know what to tell you. Here it is. Well, my friends, when Christ's crucifixion, his humiliation, his helplessness, his being mocked and his degradation, when all of this was occurring, what do you see? What do you see? Blood and gore, images you don't want in your mind, ugly stuff. That's exactly what it's intended to do because it's intended to show you how dreadful my sin and your sin is anytime and to show us how much God loves sinners such as we. Let's make a few applications. Now think with me for just a moment. Every sorrow, every grief, every pain that Christ suffered for his father's was for his father's glory and for his people's sake. He was about others. And that's how he lived. And that's exactly how he died. It was for us. Let that sink in. It was for us. Can you say Christ? Everything that he's just talked about. It was for me. It was for me. It was for my lies. It was for my thieving. It was for my, uh, my fornication. It was for uh, uh, my idolatry. It was for all of these things that I've done. The murder in my heart. Do you think in those terms? This was for me. And you know why? Because God loves me. Do you rest in that? If you don't, you're probably having a rough time in the Christian life. And unnecessarily so. Now, we're going to have a rough time. Because as long as we've got to drag this flesh around, we're going to have a tough time. But we have something that's greater than our sin. The grace of God in Jesus Christ. So our first thought is this. We should, our first application of this is we should rest our physical lives and our immortal our immortal souls on this irrefutable foundation god loves his people right, let me say that again this should be plain this should be simple this should be the way you understand life we should rest our physical lives and our immortal souls on this irrefer irrefutable Foundation, God loves his people. The very passage before us, coupled with other equally clear passages, holds an unshakable truth before us. The only problem you and I have 
is ignorance and unbelief. They usually go together. God loves us. Can you go home and say that? And believe it? And then stare down the pandemic? God loves me. Whatever he sends is coming from him. Listen. Listen to Paul. Listen. Don't drift. He that spared not his own son. That's what we're seeing. That's what the passage we've just looked at tells us. He didn't spare Jesus anything. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall we not with him also, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Oh yeah, well I don't believe that part. Really? Do you know that part's in the Bible? Let's get real here. If he didn't withhold what we have just spent 50 minutes looking at, if he didn't withhold any of that, this passage says he gives you even more. Now, are you living like that? Live like that. It's joyful. Suffer with depression. Come back at it with God's truth. Living with difficulty, difficult spouse, difficult children, difficult work. Diff uh, bah, 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 bah. You're not going to get out without suffering. What will help you get through? Not a Christian pat on the head. That never gets me through. I need to know that the God who's governing all things loves me. And this passage says he does. He does. He delivered him up for us all, meaning all there as Christians. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who? Do we understand what happened, what's happening right here? Paul is throwing down the gauntlet before the powers of darkness and the universe. He's saying, you know, imagine this to be a gauntlet, man. He's throwing this thing down in front of the universe and saying, take that. Beat that God loves his people. God loves his people. God loves his people. Who can separate us? Who's going to lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. How did he justifieth? The passage we've just looked at. They crucified him. They took his clothes and shamed him. He did all of the things that we read here. What was he doing? Paying the penalty for every one of our sins. Why did that happen? God loves us. Now you can face any day with that. My God loves me. Me. But Jeff, you're a sinner. Ah, ask my wife. Sure enough. I need to know that God loves me. Why can't we be condemned? Because Jesus was taking all the penalty for all of our wickedness. That's why Paul can go on to say, it is Christ that died. What we've just read. That is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? gauntlet who you tell me who you tell me who can separate me from the love of Christ oh that germ can no those people that are persecuting Christians no my conscience no Come after that conscience with the blood of Christ. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things. So what if you get the pandemic? What if you get coronavirus and die? What does that mean? 
your loving heavenly father sent his messenger to bring you home to the joy of the world to come. Is that true or is it not? Now you're going to live in fear of something you can't see when God has said, I'm governing all of this and I love you and I've taken care of all your sins. That was the problem. That's all done. So you can deal with it. Yes. Yes. Your unbelief may be showing right now. But I'm telling you, the strength and the glory and the joy is knowing your God loves you. And nothing can separate, separate, separate you from that glorious love. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, pandemic. No. Period. Punctuation. No. In fact, exclamation point. No! I am persuaded that neither death, what? What's the first thing on the list? He says, I'm persuaded neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. That means demons. Even demons. Things present, things to come, height, depth, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And we just saw that love set before us in five things. Unchangeable things. Jesus won our salvation on the skull. Now what are you going to deal with in life? Oh, this is a bad day. <laughs> Are you kidding? Jesus had bad days. You're going to have bad days. Unless the Lord spares you, you're going to have some days that are so bad, you wish you weren't in existence. You know what you need in those days? To know that God loves you. Not just a general, oh, he loves everybody. I mean, loves you. You! I would tell you, my, my brethren, if, if, you, if that is true, if nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, if that's true, and it is, how should we face the pandemic that's sweeping our state, our country, our world? Oh, we should bite our nails up to the elbow. No. No. Now, we don't need to be foolish. We need to realize this thing's here. We're going to be praying, Pastor Clarence and I, this week. Okay, this is getting serious out there right now. <clears throat> We've even got some of the folk in the congregation now that have been exposed to it. We need to be praying. We need to be praying. We need to be wise. We need to be cautious. But we need to know what, on every single day, my God loves me. And whether I get no case or whether the Lord takes me home, my God loves me. It all serves His purpose. <sighs> Listen to this. Listen to Paul once more. Let me tell you what now. We could go. We could go on this one. I might just do that. I got another bottle of water. Let me just say to you, brethren, what you've just seen in the passage that we've unfolded is the heart and soul. It should be the heart and soul of your life, your physical life and your spiritual life, because it is God saying writ large, I love you. I'm in control of all this. Now, listen, listen to Paul. Paul understood bad days. There's no good thing left in me. There's no good thing in me. It's just not there. Oh, Paul's depressed. No, the Holy Spirit showed Paul, Paul. And when he shows you, you, you're going to realize, uh oh, I'm just like Paul. I'm digging around in all the trash down here and I can't find anything that's good. And that's the best place in the world to be because your God loves you and he's settled that issue in Christ. 
Paul says, therefore being justified by faith, heart and soul of the Christian faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Everything that we just read, all five things is why we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory when things go our way and the stuff that we want happens. But we whine and we pout and we gripe against God when they don't. Hmm. That's not what it says. You know what it says? And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Any Christians here qualify for this? We glory. We glory. The, the, the idea of glorying here is boasting. We take pride in it. This guy needs a psychologist, right? No. No. Brethren, are you hearing the words of God? We glory, we Christians, glory in tribulations. Knowing, and this is the part some of us have trouble with. Young people, is really important for you. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Where do those tribulations come from? The hand of your loving Father. Because you're not like Christ. And you need some things that chisel off all that stuff that doesn't look like him because he's the model. Whining and griping and all that stuff, all you're doing is saying, you know, Lord, your, your love doesn't work much and I don't like the way things are going. Can you do better? He's telling you about yourself when he sends those difficulties. If you'll be quiet and listen to him, and submit in those tribulations, you'll be astonished at what he shows you about you. And then you can look to Christ and say, I can't do it. I'm having trouble. Help. And he helps. You know what, what comes with it? Repentance. You and I want to be like Christ if we're born of His Spirit. And there's something in us that wants to go in that way. Right? But when God in His mercy looks down and says, Yeah, Pollard. Phew. All right, y'all, we've got to bring in some extra stuff here to work and chisel off all this stuff. And that's what He does. And He breaks you into pieces. And He knocks stuff off of you. And it hurts. And then you realize. I needed that. I didn't believe how much unbelief was really in me. I was full of unbelief about my unbelief. Disconnecting with anybody. Are you understanding what's happening? God sends what he wants to into this world. He can use all the demons of hell and send them to your house if he wants to. Because you're going to find out, I need him. And you know what? As soon as that thought comes to your mind, you remember, oh, he loves me. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. He gave his son for me. Let me go back to that skull. Let me look at that. What happened on the skull. Look at those things that happened. Right there. He settled it all for me. He showed me that he loved me. And he washed away all my sins. Brethren. If you're not living like this. I can tell you. You're not walking the successful Christian life. It's under a cross. And then you start getting joy. 
Because all that worldly stuff that you think you don't love and you think is not affecting you starts being chiseled away. That's why Paul could say, I glory in tribulations. Look at my body. You want to see how many times I've been caned? What was he doing? Preaching the gospel. Telling people that God loved them. You're not getting out without suffering. You need to go into your suffering knowing that God loves you. And then you can rejoice. Okay. Well, man. I'll just do one more. If you can handle it. When believers sin against God, the love of God in Christ has provided cleansing. I want to know why you always get so bent out of shape with somebody else's sins, but you don't get bent out of shape with yours. Anybody in there? Easiest thing in the world is to look and see how terrible everybody else is and, and, and that they're just simply not as holy as you are. We sin, and none of it's pretty, and no, we're not better because of the five things we don't do here. We're not better. You're never better. We always have to look to Christ for our righteousness. You got that? If you don't get that, you will the rest of the day be your own standard for everybody else. When the standard is this book. And a holy, humble submission to it. God's redeeming love for us, for us, deserves our highest appreciation, our deepest enjoyment, our firmest belief, and our most loving obedience. While that is true in our pursuit of those things, believers can sin. We do. What should we do? If we profess to be believers and all of a sudden we find that we're we're still sinners. Well, first of all, go back to application one. You've got to live your physical and your spiritual life believing that God loves you. That's the place you start. Not the place you end up at. It's where you start. He loves me. He loves me today. He's going to help me through this. John the Apostle of Love tells us, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that means a holy walk. We have fellowship one with another. That means we actually fellowship with the holy God. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Get that? Where did we learn that? Back in Matthew 27. What we just looked at. Five things. The blood of Christ is what cleanses us. What was going on in that dark place is why we have light. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? Because he loves me. How do I know? Look at the blood of Christ. Look at the broken body. And as we'll see when we get to chapter 28, look at the empty tomb. God has done everything infinitely necessary to save us and to keep us. And what we have to keep in our mind through prayer, reading of the word, meditation is his love for us. It's a real love. I heard the doctrine of love so twisted and deformed in the commercial religion that I lived in until the Lord saved me. For the first few years that I was a Christian, I couldn't even say the word love. It was so distorted. It was so perverted. It was so mutilated that I got tired of it. I mean, you know, the love of God kept being bandied around in such a way that it was just absolutely zero in its value in what it meant. But when you come to the, the, the place of the skull, then you begin to see what the love of God is like in ways that you can never forget.
How and why can he cleanse us? Because God loves us in Christ. Where do we see this shining the most brightly against the background of the skull? In that place that is so hideous, we see the love of God shining. It's glorious. It's healing. It brings peace. They crucified, humiliated, enforced helplessness, mocked and degraded Christ because God loves us. That was his hand behind all of that, telling us, I love you. Mark Jones quotes the Puritan William Bates. I did a double take the first time I heard this. <clears throat> a greater love was expressed to wretched man than to Christ himself. How so? God, in giving him to die for us, declared that our salvation was more dear to him than the life of his only son. I disagreed with that when I heard it. I went, no, can't be right. But then the more I began to think on it, I realized I get what he's saying. We don't know the depths of God's thinking. We don't know the depths of God's attributes. We don't know all of those things as clearly as we'd like to. But here's the deal. He loved our lives so much, he sacrificed his son's life. And he goes on to say, in other words, God would never have put his son through such torment and suffering unless he wished to display the greatness of his love toward his people. Every humiliation, every trial, every heartache and suffering that our Savior experienced was God showing his love toward us. Now, if that's not practical, if that's not helpful to you as you face tomorrow I'm running low on things to encourage you with but I can tell you if you'll just go to the place of a skull park there and look at God's extraordinary love for you when things get intense when things get overwhelming when fears about pandemics and riots and violence and all of these things happening to our world it's all under God's hand and the God that's ruling over all of it loves us don't forget that obviously there's more to say but that's enough for today God loves you dear children of God do you really live like that's true I close with these words, sorry for the other pass on the other applications. But as long as we have breath, let us look at God's love to us in Christ's cross. Nails and thorns mark his limbs and head. And what a price to save the living dead. But when we look upon his cross, we can see that the greatest gift of all is that God gave Christ his son to us. And he's revealed his love so clearly in the place of a skull. Christ's love, uh, God's love in Christ's cross. Amen. Oh God, we need thee. We need thee. We're facing things every day that could... Uh, pull us apart. But Father, when we understand that at the center of everything that's happening anywhere and everywhere in this world, thou art ruling in goodness and thou dost love us. May we look at Christ and ever see it in his cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Let's stand.
God has raised us up for this day, we need to know and believe the truth. This world needs to see hope in people like you and me. They need to realize we can face what's happening because our God loves us. That said, I close with this. <clears throat> now the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's go in the name of the Lord.